This tutorial is for you if you know some basic Python or want to learn basic Python and have your family tree online or in a desktop application. I'm going to show you how to turn your family tree into a database on your local computer. Then I'll show you how to build a Python script to do analysis and run reports against that database. We'll build up from simple queries to a full report of all people in your tree. This is part one of a two part tutorial. It just got too long to complete in one session. I have an older tutorial on this channel about using a Python script to extract names, birth and death details. But a lot of people ask me about retrieving other facts like baptism, marriage, burials and whatever else you add to your tree. So rather than me trying to predict what different people want in a CAN script, I'm going to teach you the Python commands so you can build your own scripts and get what you need. The first thing to do is to export your family tree to a JetCom file. JetCom is a file format for the storage and transfer of family trees between different software applications. If your family tree is online on Ancestry, MyHeritage or Jenny, I'll put some links in the description below to tutorials for downloading the tree to JetCom. For example, this is Ancestry a small tree. To download this tree to a JetCom file on your local machine, click these three dots here and go to tree settings. Then over on the right, you're looking for this link to export your tree. Click export and then you just wait while the file is being prepared. Once it's prepared, you'll see this blue button, download your JetCom file. Hit the button and you just see up here it's downloading. If I open that, this is my downloads folder and you can see here is the JetCom file. If you're having trouble with a particular website, drop a comment in the description below. I will tell you that if your tree is on familysearch.org, you can't export a JetCom of your tree within the wider family search tree. If instead of having an online family tree, you have tree and desktop software. If you have family tree builder, or Family Tree Maker, the export option is under the file menu. And then I will also say that if you have Roots Magic, then you don't need to export your JetCom file. So stick with me, you don't need that step. So now you have your JetCom file. The next step is to convert that JetCom file to a SQL database. And we're going to do that using a free version of the Roots Magic software. So Roots Magic has a paid version and then it has a free version it refers to as Essentials. I'll put the link here. Just go to rootsmagic.com, to Roots Magic, try it free. You don't need to put in any of this. You can just click that off. So click that download button. It'll bring down the installer into your downloads folder. Double click the installer. So I'm just going to hit click the download. Unusually, Roots Magic say to take the 32 bit version, regardless of whether you've got a modern or an older version of Windows. Just follow what they say, or else take the Mac version. I'll download this. And here is the installer. The reason it's got a one there is this is the second time I've downloaded it. I've already tested installing Roots Magic 9. Set the agreement, create a desktop shortcut, hit install. And we launch Roots Magic. So, as you can see, it's giving you the option to purchase the full version. We'll just take the free version. Here is Roots Magic free version. I have a couple of trees already that it's kind of confined. You may have, if this is your first time using it, you're not going to see any anything here under recent files what you want to do is import the jetcom file that you've just downloaded or exported so we will go to import file under roots magic files we are going to pick jetcom from these choices and then you need to find the files i look directly for this small tree that I've downloaded, I'm going to click open. And then it's asking you to pick a destination for what will be the root magic file. So click browse. You want to put it someplace where you can find it. I'm going to put it in the same place I have my JetCom file. 
and I'll click save. Here you can keep most of the formats. I like to take off web hints. So one of the things that you can do with the free version of Reaps Magic, which is quite neat, is that you can sync it with your ancestry tree and then you kind of see web hints, etc. I'm not going to be syncing it with my ancestry tree. All I'm using Roots Magic for is to convert the JetCom file into a SQL database that I can use outside of Roots Magic. So I'm just going to click OK and OK on that. And here we've got this little tree. At this point, I'm not going to use Roots Magic further. If you want to check it out, some of the features will not be enabled. It's actually quite a nice piece of software if you want to pay the 40 bucks, but I'll keep to the free version for the point of this tutorial. So now I have a Roots Magic tree on my local machine. And if you look up here, it's telling you exactly where it is. I want to go to that folder. If I order by date modified, here are the two Roots Magic files. We have these two files. One is .lst, you can ignore that one. This is the one that is Basically, this is a SQL database. And all I need to do now is to make a note of the full file path and name of that database file so that I can connect to it from a Python script. So I'm now going to close Roots Magic. Just skip the backup. And I don't need to use Roots Magic again. Next step is to install Python environment on your local machine if you don't already have one. I'm going to walk you through installing the Anaconda Python environment because it's a great choice for a beginner. Go to the anaconda.com website and then you need to find the downloads page. It does change around in terms of how you get to it from time to time. I'm just going to go to this free download link here at the top. Then it's going to ask me to register. You don't need to register your email address. You can if you want to, but you can skip registration. And here we have the download page. You have a few options as you can see. You have Windows, Mac and Linux. Take the option that's right for you. For me, I want this Windows installer. I'm going to click on that. Download started and that is going to come down to my downloads folder on my local machine. So here it is in my downloads folder. I'm going to double click the installer and it's the standard Windows installer. I'm going to click next, agree to the license. This is where it's going to put it in my destination folder. I'm going to uncheck registering Anaconda as my default Python environment. I do have other Python environments, but if this is your only one, it's okay to leave this checked. And now I'm going to click install. It can take a little bit of time to do all its downloads. Okay, that's completed. That actually took a few minutes for me, so don't worry if it's a bit slow for you too. Click next. Next one more time. I'm going to uncheck these options and click finish. So now you need to start your Anaconda environment and start using Python. The way we do so is to use what's known as the Anaconda prompt. On a Windows machine, you can use this search entry here. Just, just type in Anaconda. Anaconda, and here you see the Anaconda prompt. So just click on Anaconda prompt, and that opens up a prompt window. And now you can change directory, cd, change directory, to the folder that you're going to store your Python work. For me, that's this Windows folder here, so I'll just copy that, paste it here, and now I'm in this folder, currently empty. And the next step, to start using Python, is to type Jupyter Notebook. Make a note of that command. You're going to run it every time you're working with Python within an Anaconda environment. Click Enter. And just wait for it to do its work. What you'll see is a browser window open. Here is my browser window. If you already had a browser window open looking up Google or Anaconda.com, then you mightn't be aware that something has happened here. Just go and look for an extra tab in your open browser. And when you change to that tab, you're going to see this localhost 8888. And this is the interface for your Jupyter environment. At the moment, it's looking for files where you ran the command. 
which is in our empty Python work folder, so it's not seeing any files. So the next thing to do is to create a new Python notebook. And a notebook is the Jupyter term for a file where you're writing your Python commands. So I'm going to click New Notebook, and this opens up another tab. It's created a file called Untitled. So I'm just going to change the name to Tree, rename. So now rename that as Tree. And if we look in the underlying folder in Windows, we can see we have this tree.ipynb, interactive Python notebook. And here we can enter our Python commands. So this box here is known as the cell. I am going to write print hello world. That is a command in the Python syntax. And in order to run that cell and the commands in that cell, there's just the one, I'm going to click the run button. And you can see that hello world has been printed and the environment assumes that you want to do more work. So it's created a new cell for you to enter more Python commands. Printing hello world is nice, but let's do some real Python work with our family tree database. I'm going to get rid of this cell, clicking into it, and I'm clicking the scissors icon to cut it, leaving me with this cell. And the first thing I want to do is to import three Python packages that will let me work more easily with the file system, with our database, and with the data inside that database. So I am going to import the OS package, enter for a new line. I'm going to import SQL light three, type that exactly, new line, and I'm going to import pandas package and give it an alias. So import pandas, and as I'm going to be using this package frequently, I'm going to give myself a shortcut for typing. So I'll give it an alias of PD. Got these three lines now, I'm going to click run. No errors, so that's good. You don't get any output, but if there was an error, you'd see error messages. Now that I've got these packages, I want to connect to my family tree database. When you imported your JetConf file with Oots Magic, we took a note of the folder where that .rm tree file was. So just go and find that again. So for me, it's in this Roots Magic folder. And the particular file I'm going to use is this file, and it's called My Family Tree. So I need the full folder name. So I'm going to copy that. And now I'm going to give myself a variable name called file path equal to, and I'm just going to paste in, or you can type in that particular path. Now, if you're on a Windows machine, you're going to have to amend this slightly. You are going to have to put in double slashes. So where you have a slash, you need to prefix that with a slash. Just double up in those slashes. And just to remind myself that this is for Windows, I am going to give myself a comment using the hash. You see the text will go green. That any comments do not get run. Windows. Now, if you're on a Mac, your file path is going to look something like this. You can see with the Mac, the slashes are in a different direction, etc. But I'm not using a Mac, so I'm just going to comment that out. My file name, which for me was my family tree.rm tree. And now I want to join the file path and the file name together to give me the full file path. I'm going to give myself a new variable called db file equal to, and this is where the OS package comes into its own os.path.com join file underscore path file underscore name. And just to know that this makes sense, I'm going to print out that variable. So you need to replace that with your file path. You need to replace this file name with your file name, and that looks good. So now I have the path to that SQLite file in a variable. I'm going to connect to it using the SQLite package. So I'm going to give myself a connection variable called con. I'm using the SQLite package. I'm using the connect function and I'm providing that connect function with the full file path to my SQLite file. And now I'm going to click run. No errors. That's a good sign. It's a good idea when you're working with a new database to take a look at the tables that are in that database. So we're going to give ourselves a query that does exactly that. And I'm going to put that query into a variable. 
The query is select name from SQLite underscore master where type equal to table because I'm putting table in single quote quotations I'll change those outer quotations to double quotations. SQLite master is a special table or view in every SQLite database which holds data about the structure of the database itself. Now that I've got that in a query I need to run that query against my particular database using this connection. And I'm going to put the results into what's known as a data frame. Handus library gives me a handy structure that is very useful for viewing and manipulating data. We're going to be using it all through this tutorial. I'm going to give myself a name for my data frame. So I'm going to have a data frame called DF tables. I'm going to use the pandas package. So PD, I'm going to use a function in that package called read SQL query and that function takes the query so I'm passing it in this query variable and then the second parameter is the actual connection to the database. This read SQL query function uses the connection to send the query that we've defined here and puts the results of the query into a data frame. For now I'll just run the query and now you can't see it, but this DF tables data frame is now populated with the results of this query. But it'd be a good idea to take a look. So I'm going to use the print command, DF tables, click run. And here we've got actually 29 tables because we've started zero in our family tree database. Now these tables aren't going to mean much to you, but you can take a guess at the meaning of some of them. And I will tell you for this particular tutorial to run the reports that we want, we are going to use about five important tables and you'll hardly ever need to use the other tables in this database. In this tutorial, we show you all the commands to type into your Python cell. If you don't want to do the typing, you can download a copy of the notebook. We'll put a link in the description below to where you can grab it. I want this. You just need to provide your email and you will be given a download of a zip file. That will come down to your downloads folder. Unzip the file and then go to your Anaconda environment and upload the .ipynb file. So click upload, find the .ipynb file that you've extracted from the zip file and choose open. It'll come into your environment. You can open it then. You can run each cell while you follow along with this tutorial. Now let's do some useful analysis of the data. We're going to create a report that lists all people with their names in the family tree. It's a basic report. We start off simple and then we'll expand on it with more data. Keep track of what I'm doing in this script as it gets longer. I'm going to use an anaconda feature, which is put in a heading or a subheading using HTML syntax. If you're not familiar with that, it's just the H2 symbol, which is a heading. And I'm going to call this person and name details. It's just to mark this section. And I need to close the H2 with a backslash H2. This is not Python syntax. So if you're actually following along this tutorial using PyCharm, or some other Python editor. Don't do this, put in a comment instead. So if I just run this, I get an error because it's not valid Python syntax. This is Jupyter Notebook syntax. So I have to tell the cell that this isn't Python, this is to be marked as something else. So I use the drop down here, code drop down. This isn't Python code, this is markdown syntax. So I've changed the type of that cell. I hit run again, and now you see it's like a large comment. Now I'm going to query the data in one of these tables. And the table I'm targeting is a person table. I'm looking for the table that has every person in my family tree. And this is a good candidate. In fact, it is the correct candidate. So I'm going to give myself a new data frame. I'm going to call it DF person table. I'm going to read using the pandas. And this time, instead of putting the query into a variable, I'm just going to type it straight in as a string parameter. And this query is select star that's give me everything from the name of the table being person table by the way the capitals don't matter you can put this in lowercase if you like second parameter is the connection variable and i will run this now my data frame is populated with the contents of that table so i'm just going to take a look at the first five rows pandas 
Data frame comes with a handy head function, which does exactly that. If I wanted to see the first 10 rows, I'd stick a 10 in here. The default is five. Well, I'm getting five rows, all right, but none of this is particularly helpful. I have an ID. I have this unique ID, but I'm not seeing any name details, but I'm also not seeing every column. So notice this triple dot, basically that's the anaconda environment telling you that it's truncated some of the display. In order to inspect the table and see what we might be missing, there could be some handy name details, perhaps birth date. We will take a look at a list of the columns themselves, name of the data frame, columns, run that. And here is the full list of columns. So I'm still not seeing things like name details, so I know that those must be in another table. As an aside, if you're wondering what this color business is as it relates to your JetCom, remember this is a converted Roots Magic database. The Roots Magic application has various other features like adding colors to persons. So these columns pertain to the Roots Magic features, and we're not that interested in that. One more useful thing to do when you're looking at a table that you don't know is we're going to count the number of rows. I know I have 534 people in this particular version of my family tree. So to count the number of rows in a data frame, you can use the len function. Len is a shortcut for length. Len person table, run that, and I have 534 records in this table with each being assigned a person ID starting from one. So now I want to take a look at a second table, and that second table is this name table. Remember, I'm on a hunt for the names. So this time I'm going to call my data frame name table, read, read SQL, select star from name table, Pass the connection. And within the same cell, I'll take a quick look at the contents. Now we're getting somewhere. Note that I have a surname and I have a given name. Even over to the right here, I have a birth year and a death year. Why they're associated with the name table is worth asking. And notice that it's just a year. Where's the month and the day? Well, Roots Magic have decided, for whatever reasons, to tack in just the birth year and the death year, just to add it into the name table as a kind of a shortcut. I'm just going to ignore those two columns for now because the full dates are in another table. Here, I just want to focus on the names. So now I'm going to do a count on the name table. Copy this down and change let person to name. So the length of the name table. And notice it's 536. I've got two more rows in the name table than I have in the person table. Why? And how does the person table, the name table relate to each other? At this point, I'm going to show you a diagram as to how these two tables relate to each other. This is how details are stored about people and their names in the Roots Magic database. So every single person in your family tree has one row in the person table, and that is given a particular ID. And pretty much the only other field in that table that is useful to us is the gender field. Why aren't the given and surname details in the person table? That's because it's possible for a person to have multiple names. So a person may go by a different name to what's on their birth certificate, and you may choose in your family tree to record an entry for both the name that appears in the birth certificate, the name they go by, for example, a nickname, or if they've had a legal name change. So the database separates out the name table from the person table to allow any given person to have multiple names. This is where the is primary field comes into play. When a person has multiple names, one of them will be marked as primary. That is primary field will be set to true and the other names will be marked as false. It could be a little bit clearer if you actually see some data. I'm going to do some investigative analysis on my database now and these queries will work on yours too. I want to see which persons in my tree have more than one name. So the first thing I want to do is get a data set together that has a count of their number of name records for individual persons. So I'm going to call this data frame df names per person and I'm going to fill this from df name table. I want to group on that unique person ID, which happens to be called owner ID in the name table. I want to group by 
owner ID and just go with me on this syntax and this final parameter to this function is we're going to put the count of the names per person into its own field. And so we need to give that field a name and I'm going to call it, I have no originality here, I'm going to call it count. So I will run this and let's take a sneaky look at some rows in this table. I'm not surprised to see a count 1111 here. Most of the persons in my database only have one name. Yours might be different. You might have lots of persons with multiple names. I'm going to focus in on those particular persons that do actually have more than one name. So I'm going to call that data frame df plus one. And this is df names per person. I'm going to filter on that count where it is greater than one. Within that data frame, I'm looking for this specific column of count here where that value is greater than one. And I'm assigning that result set into this new data frame. And what I'll do is I will take a look at that in the cell, run that. And you can see I'm only pulling back two rows here. And now I'm interested in taking a look at those actual people. So I'm going to show the rows in DF name table where the owner ID is, I'll take 90. I've got to name that specific column, owner ID, and I want it equal to 90. In Python, equal is you put in two equal symbols, not one. I'm just gonna use head because I'm only gonna see two rows. And here we go. So I have two name records with two different name IDs, 91 and 92, but for the same person, 90, they have the same surname. Each has a different given name. If I take a look here at replacing the 90 with seven. Ah, okay. So here I have person, same owner ID, multiple name records, same surname. Their given name in one record is Thomas and the other is Timothy. Suppose I use the name table. When I want to put a report together of every single person, I want to show their first name, last name, date of birth, date of death. I don't want two rows for the same person. And this is where, as I mentioned, if I scroll over to, to the right, oh, it's not showing it. There isn't his primary in here somewhere. I'm going to tell the notebook to display all the columns, right? So in a separate command, I'm going to scroll up to the top and up here at the very top of the notebook, I'm going to run this command. I'm telling pandas here to display max columns. So I'm just going to run that. And then I'm going to hop back down to where I was, scroll back down, I'm going to run this. And now I get a much wider display. And here's that column is now clear. So one of these two rows has been set to the primary. Primary is equal to true. And the other one is set to false. So now that I know that I do want to filter out the non-primary names, I'm going to give myself a new data frame. I also don't just want the names. I would like to have that gender field that was in the person table. Let's take another look at it. We go scroll up a little bit. So this field here is male or female. Between one and zero, I can't remember which is male or which is female, but it'll become clearer a bit later and we'll tidy up the display. So I want a data frame that merges in the person ID and the gender from the person table with the given name and surname from the name table, but also restricts and only takes the primary name for each person. So let's put that together. I'll start with my merge table. I'm going to just call it df merged. I'm using the merge function of pandas. And my two data sets are df person table and df name table. And as I mentioned, Roots Magic has named the same ID as person ID in person table, that corresponds to the owner ID in the name table. So DF person table is on the left. So left on equal person ID. And we're going to merge that. We're going to join to the table on the right, which is the DF name table. And there it's named owner ID. Run that. If I now look at the columns in DF merged, there's going to be a lot. So we now have in DF merged, we have our person ID, well, we have the gender here, but all those color fields, etc., that we're not particularly interested in are here. But then we get to the fields from the, from the name table, which are these ones. So they're all merged in this wide data set, which we can take a quick look at. Now that I've got that setting, which is to show max columns, you can see there's my person ID. And over here, my surname 
and given, I only want a few of these columns, but we'll sort that out. Before I sort out the columns, I have, as far as I'm concerned, too many rows in DF merged because I have multiple names against two persons. I want to filter those out. So I'm going to restrict to the primary name. So now I'm going to give myself a new data set called primary name, which is going to take the data from DF merged, and I'm going to filter on a particular column, the is primary column. So I need to name that column is primary, and I'm going to filter where that column is equal to true or is equal to one. We're on this. Oops, my brackets right. Right. And now if I count the number of rows in DF primary name, I'm now back to 534. But DF primary name has all these columns that I don't want, and it just makes looking at the data a bit of a pain in the neck. So I'm going to take a subset of those columns into another data set called DF person. I'm going to set DF person is equal to DF primary name, but only a list of columns that I'm interested in, which would be the person ID, the given name, the surname, and gender. Just being a little bit careful of YouTube's kind of algorithms by saying gender, as opposed to what you can clearly see is the name of the field. So now, if I take a look at DF person, here's my first five rows, and it's a much easier list to read. I can also see that in terms of the JETCOM, the gender of zero is assigned to a male. I'm just going off the names, right? And a gender of one is assigned to a female. Right. So if you've got this far, well done. We've now got our basic list of every person in the database with their primary name. And you can do useful stuff with that. like. For this point, you could actually do some reports on the frequency of names. You could find the most common name in your family tree by doing counts on unique surnames. You could find the least common name, etc. Useful reports. But for this particular tutorial, we're looking to prepare a report on the basic person details of their given name and surname plus their birth and death details. And by showing you how to get the birth and death details, it'll also be clear how you can get other details like marriage, burial, baptism, etc. So because of my concerns about the YouTube algorithm and not wanting to say the name of that fourth column, I'm just going to go ahead and change the name. If you don't have to, it just makes life easier for me. Rename a column, F person dot rename columns equal to and the second parameter is in place equal to true. Just run that. So I'm getting a warning message here. A warning, not an error. Let's have a quick look at the actual data set just to see if the rename has taken place. And you see it has. So you don't need to be too worried about that warning message. Next thing I want to do with this gender column is to make the display more helpful. So zeros and ones aren't very clear. So I want to replace the value of zero with M for male, and the value of one with F for female. And this is the statement. So we're working on the gender column, and we're using this map function to change zero to M and one to F. Just run that. Once again, I get this warning. I'm going to copy and run the head statement. And as you can see, I now have changed values. So at this point, we do have a nice little basic report, and you may want to get that data out of this particular Python data frame and, for example, put it into a spreadsheet. So let's save this data into a file that we can import into the spreadsheet of your choice, be it Excel, be it Google Sheets or another application. We'll save the data file into the same area where we have our Python notebook. For me, I'll put it into variable. The path is on my Windows machine. It looks like that. And as I've already mentioned, we need on Windows, we just need to, to prefix one slash with another. So that is the file path. My file name, I'll call this one person name dot CSV. I'll use the OS package that I've imported at the top of this notebook to join those into this variable name. And then I am going to use a function on the pandas data frame, df person dot who underscore CSV. So that's a function to underscore CSV, which writes the contents of a data frame to a delimited file. Give it the name of the file. I've put the name of the file into this variable. That's the first parameter. And this is the second parameter, index equal to false. By not specifying a separator, 
there is a separated parameter i'm not using it by default this is saved to a file where the delimiter is a comma so i'm just going to run this and now when i go to that folder in windows explorer you can see i have a file named person name.csv because i have microsoft excel office 365 installed on my laptop it recognizes the .csv as an excel file and because it's comma delimited if i double click on this it just opens straight up into a spreadsheet just to illustrate that is a csv file if i open this instead with notepad plus plus you can see that the raw file it is just a text file has commas in it that is your first python report from your family tree well done for getting this far this video is a shortened version of lesson one of our online course on how to use python to analyze family trees the course is based around 10 python projects where we build up scripts to run useful analysis on your tree here's a course breakdown you've already worked through creating the person list lesson two involves creating a surname frequency report, which will give you insights into the most prominent family lines in your tree. Lesson three shows you how to parse the addresses for the birthplaces and death places into manageable pieces for further analysis. That would be pieces such as the town, state and countries into separate fields. Once you've separated out the addresses, lesson four builds on this to create frequency reports for state, towns and counties. This will let you identify key locations in your family's history. Still working with locations, lesson five gives you the at this place report where you learn how to create a list of all the family tree events, births, marriages, deaths, etc. Whatever you've added as facts to your family tree at a given location. Then we move on to provide a similar report of family tree events at a specific date. Lesson seven involves doing some data cleansing on your family tree. So we show you techniques and queries to find duplicate individuals in your tree. Lesson eight, we look at some classic age issues that would include individuals whose birth and death date mean that they must have lived 170 years. So something's gone wrong in your record. Lesson nine is a gap report where we will identify missing details in your tree. That would include married women without a maiden name or all the people without a death location. Lesson 10, we show you how to extract the ancestral lines from your tree, grandparents, great grandparents, and so on, as far back as the number of generations in your tree. And lesson 11 is a gap report. So if most of your ancestral lines are going back eight generations, but you have a few that go back maybe five or six, you can quickly highlight those and know where to direct your research. So if you're really interested in this course, it's not quite ready to launch yet. We'll put a link in the description below to where you can pre-register for the course for free. We just need your email and we will send you notification of when the course lessons become available for purchase.